three consecutive even integers are such that two times the first plus three times the second plus three times the third is 114. So here's my three consecutive even integers and n plus two n plus four. Remember the setup for consecutive even and the setup for consecutive odd is the same. Now writing it out in words so that I can easily transcribe it. Two times the first plus three times the second plus three times the third is 114. The first is n so that's two times the first is 2n. Three times the second is three times n plus two and three times the third is three times n plus four and that's going to equal 114. So distributing the three, three n plus six, distributing the three over here, three n plus twelve, <coughs> same size, same operation, combining like terms, eight n's all together, two n's, three n's, three n's is eight n's and then six and twelve make eighteen. Subtracting eighteen from both sides, eight n's ninety six, dividing by eight I get n is twelve, so my three consecutive integers are 12, 14, and 16. Next up, area of a rectangle is length times width. So if I factor this, I'll get the two things that can multiply out to equal 15x plus 20. So this is just a uh, roundabout way of saying, hey, factor 15x plus 20. They share a five in common. That's five times three x plus four. Factor using the greatest common factor. Well, they share a 10 in common and an x. So I pull out a 10x. I'm left with 2 minus 3x. And as always with factoring, simply check yourself by multiplying back. 10x times 2 is 20x. 10x times negative 3 is negative 30x squared. Just make sure you pull out the greatest common factor here. It's 10x. You could have pulled out just a 10. You could have pulled out a 5, a 2, a 5x, a 2x. There's lots of options here, but the greatest common factor, which it said to use, is 10x. Okay, factor each trinomial. We went over this in, in video one, but remember, basically you have two options. One is the AM technique. You multiply out to the last term, add up to the middle. So that is to say in this one, you multiply out to positive 20, add up to negative nine, or you can use the calculator and you can use Y1 equals whatever the last term is, 20 divided by X. And then Y2 is in parentheses, whatever it says in Y1 plus X. Then you look in the last column for whatever the middle says, in this case, where the A is, that's negative 9. And then you look at the two previous columns. Either way, you'll come up with negative 5 and negative 4. So that makes the factors X minus 5 and X minus 4. Here, I get X minus 9, excuse me, times X plus 2. Now, you really should always look for a greatest common factor before you start. But in examples like A and B, the lead coefficient's 1. So it's trivial. You don't need to do that. But in C, it's a 3. And plan A is always to get this greatest common factor. So it's a three. So that's three times x squared minus three x minus four. Factoring there, three times x minus four times x plus one. Now, um, when I look for that greatest common factor, um, now, um, what two numbers multiply out to negative four and add up to negative three? It's x minus four times x plus one. So the greatest common factor, three, x minus four, x plus one. All three parts have to be included in the answer. Now in letter D, you say, oh, there's my two. Let me look for the, uh oh, there is no greatest common factor of two. So we don't do plan A, we do plan B. Multiply by two on the end. That gives me x squared plus nine x plus 20. Factoring that out, I get x plus 5 times x plus 4. But I changed the question there. But since I multiplied by 2, I have to divide back in by 2. 4 over 2 reduces to 2, so that's x plus 2. In this case, the 2 comes in front of the x, and I get 2x plus 5. So it's 2x plus 5 times x plus 2, and that's my correct answer. Um, for x squared minus 81, I get x plus 9, x minus 9. Okay, remember there's really a zero x in the middle. So I'm looking for two numbers that multiply out to negative 81, add up to zero. So that's positive nine, negative nine. Next up, what factor do the following trinomials have in common? Uh, this is, if I factor the first one, it's x plus seven, x minus four. If I factor the second, it's x minus five, x minus four. So in this case, the factor that they have in common is x minus four. Length of a rectangle represented by 2c plus 7, width by 2c minus 5. So the area is always length times width. 
So I do 2c plus 7 times 2c minus 5, double distribute, 2c times 2c is 4c squared, 2c times negative 5 is negative 10c, 7 times 2c is 14c, 7 times negative 5 is negative 35. Combining like terms in the middle there, I get plus 4c's. So 4c squared plus 4c minus 35. Number 18, fill in the table. You can do this right on your calculator. You can do, remember the rule is y equals 2 thirds x minus 3. So the input is x. So it's 2 thirds times, here's the x column with the input, negative 3 minus 3. A couple of different ways you can do this. You can do alpha y equals to produce the fraction 2 thirds. And then just type next to that, parenthesis negative 3 minus 3. And it'll tell you negative 5. Or you could do... 2 times negative 3 divided by 3, get the, and then enter, get that answer, and then do minus 3. It'll tell you negative 5. Same thing for the next thing. 2 times 0 divided by 3, get that answer, it'll tell you 0, minus 3 is negative 3. Or if you were doing the alpha y equals, which I think is the best way, alpha y equals, just hit enter, and you get 2 in the template for the numerator, 3 for the denominator, times 3, minus 3, and you get negative 1. So A is negative 5, B is negative 3, C is negative 1. Number 19, write the equation of a line in slope-intercept form that passes through negative 1, 4, and 2, 10. So the general equation of a line in slope-intercept form is y equals mx plus b. I need the slope. I need the y-intercept. So I do that. Um, I figure out the slope first by using the slope formula. And it doesn't matter which is the second point, which is the first. I made the second point 2, 10. 10 minus 4 in the numerator, 2 minus negative 1 in the denominator. That's 6 over 3, which is 2. So now I know part of the answer. It's y equals 2x plus b. To find b, I can use either of the two points I'm given. I used the, top, the second point. doesn't make a difference. 10 equals 2 times 2 plus b. 10 equals 4 plus b, so b is 6. My final answer is y equals 2x plus 6. Now... I do want to mention that as I look through these review sheets, I don't see a question about perpendicular. And it would be unlike me to not include a perpendicular question on your final. I literally go through and I, I look at all the topics in the course, and then I make sure I reflect the topics in the course when I create the final exam. And in this case, I, boy, I don't remember if there's a question about perpendicular on your final or not, but I would suspect knowing me the way I do, it's probably there, yet there's no review question on perpendicular. So I always want to take a moment right here to explain perpendicular. A perpendicular slope is the negative reciprocal. Everything else is done the same way, but a perpendicular slope is the negative reciprocal. So for example, it says write the equation of a line with a slope of negative one third and passing through this point. If it said perpendicular to a slope of a line of negative one third, then the perpendicular line would be positive three. You flip it and you change the sign. Okay, so now we'll go through this one where the slope actually is negative one-third. So y equals negative one-third x plus b. Use this point, negative three, three. So I get three equals negative one-third times negative three plus b. Negative a third times negative three is one. Subtracting the one, I get b is two. And that means my slope, or the equation of my line, is y equals negative one-third x, because they told you the slope was negative one-third, and then plus two at the end. Okay. Which is the correct graph for this line? I'm going to subtract 4x from both sides. That gives me 3y equals negative 4x minus 3. Then I'm going to divide by 3, and I get y equals negative 4 thirds x minus 1. So the slope is negative 4 thirds. The y-intercept is negative 1. Which of those lines look like this? Definitely the second one. Passes through negative 1, down 4 over 3. Okay, what's the equation of the line pictured below? Well, the y-intercept is 1. The slope is up 1 over 2, up 1 over 2. So that's y equals 1 half x, because the slope, how you move, is up 1 over 2. So it's 1 half x plus 1. Write the equation of a line parallel. Parallel equals slopes. Remember, we already talked about perpendicular. That means this one has to be y equals 3 sevenths x but it has the same y-intercept as this guy, so it's plus 1. Um, write the equation of a line parallel to y minus 2x equals 3 with the same y-intercept as 5y equals x plus 15. A little bit of a quirk here, but we'll just go with it. Add 2x to both sides, so my slope is 2. Parallel lines have equal slopes. On the other side, I need to divide by 5, and 
a little freak of nature here, I come up with um, a y-intercept of 3. So it's actually the same line as over here that I started with, y equals 2x plus 3. Um, number 25, we want to talk about labeling functions by their equations. And they can be absolute value, linear, quadratic, or exponential. First one's linear because the highest exponent's 1. Next one's quadratic because squared is the highest exponent. Next one's absolute value. These bars show absolute value. Letter D is exponential because the variable is in the exponent place. And letter E is quadratic because the squared is right up here. Now we can also identify by looking at the picture. This is exponential here. Just remember this gentle curve going up or down. Exponential. If it makes a V, it's absolute value, V value, okay? Definite sharp turn of a V. As opposed to this last one, which has a gentle U-shaped curve, that is a quadratic. And the second letter, letter of quadratic is U, okay? Exponential again. All right, so those are, um, by looking at the picture, oh, my dogs are going off. Sorry about that. Number 27, absolute value equation. So absolute value means the distance from zero. So this could be either positive 18 away or it could be negative 18 away. First, I consider the case that it's negative 18. I solve it, I come up with n is negative two. Okay, that's one possible answer. It could also be positive 18 away. And that's the key is to set one up to negative 18, one up to positive 18. I solve that the same way I solve any standard two-stepper, I get seven. So this has two answers, negative two and seven. Absolute value equations will typically have two answers for linear ones. Solve the following inequalities for n. Now this is an absolute value inequality, and that's a little bit challenging. So you wanna be less than or equal to 12 units away. So whenever we get an absolute value that's less than, the answer will always look like a bounded interval, as it did here where I circled it. And if it's greater than, it'll always be something or something because the lines will shoot out in opposite directions. So, um, if you are less than or equal to 12 units away from the origin, you are greater than or equal to negative 12. So we have to switch that sign when we negate an inequality, which we know. Solving that, I get n is greater than or equal to negative 7. Or you're less than or equal to positive 12, the way it was. And that works out to be n is less than or equal to 5. So it's negative 7, less than or equal to n, less than or equal to 5. And the next one, I'm going to subtract 7 from both sides. It says greater than 15. If you're greater than 15, you're less than negative 15. So here it is, less than negative 15. Because a number like negative 100 is more than 15 units, greater than 15 units away from the origin. So minusing the 7, I get negative 22. Dividing by 3, I get negative 7 and 1 third. Or subtracting 7, because I could also be greater than 15, as it says. So I subtract 7, I get 8, divided by 3, or n is greater than 2 and 2 thirds. Remember, if it is a greater than statement with an absolute value inequality, you'll get your answer will be in the form this or that. And if it's less than or equal to, it'll be a bounded interval like it is here with the negative 7, less than or equal to n, less than or equal to 5. Okay, second video done, third to go.